Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. At a time when rising anti-Semitism has become the number one concern of the Jewish community, the main front for the effort to combat the spread of Jew hatred has become college campuses. The spread, the academy has become the place where some of the most bitter battles are being fought to defend the rights of Jewish students at a time when fashionable ideologies, such as critical race theory and intersectionalism, have made open support for Israel, Zionism, and Jewish identity controversial. Such toxic ideas are particularly dangerous because their advocates have more or less taken over most departments that teach about the Middle East and Israel, and these professors set the tone for these discussions on these issues and encourage anti-Israel forces to be even more aggressive and in their behavior and also discourage Jewish students from speaking up. For some, the question is whether anything even ought to be done to deal with this problem. They worry that efforts to combat anti-Semitism on campuses is an infringement of free speech or an unwarranted interference in academic freedom. But while much of the Jewish community wrung its hands impotently in the face of the rising challenge, some looked to the law, or more specifically to Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibited discrimination in education and gave leverage to the federal government, which provides so much of the money that pays for higher education these days, for a solution. One person more than any other played a crucial role in bringing this issue to light and taking action on it. And we're pleased to have him with us today to talk about his work. Kenneth Marcus is the founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. He's also a distinguished fellow at the Center for Liberty and Law of the Antonin Scalia Law School of George Mason University, and the author of books such as The Definition of Antisemitism and Jewish Identity and Civil Rights in America. He has served as Assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, Staff Director at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and General Deputy Assistant U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. He previously served as Equality and Justice and in America uh, Chair at the City University's Bernard Baruch School of Public Affairs and Visiting Research Professor of Political Science at Yeshiva University. He's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Contemporary Antisemitism and chairs a committee for the Federalist Society. And he's written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Newsweek, US Today, USA Today, Politico, and Academic Journals. Ken Marcus, welcome to Top Story. You played an important role in two administrations in efforts to combat anti-Semitism on college campuses. Can you explain exactly how the federal government can do this under the law? Sure, um, and uh, the key is that the federal government can do it now, but wasn't doing it before and needs to do it better. Uh, back in the George W. Bush administration, what I found is that the Federal Office for Civil Rights was not handling any anti-Semitism cases because the applicable civil rights law, the one you described, Title VI, prohibits discrimination in uh, federally funded universities based on race, color, or national origin. And the agency had previously taken the view that Jews do not share race, color, or national origin. They share only religion, and religion isn't covered. So that's why I had to make the change back in 2004, so that for the first time, the agency would be dealing with anti-Semitism at all. And even that was controversial. So that that policy was not consistently applied between 2004 and 2011. It's taken a great deal of effort my own, my successors, and various Jewish communal organizations just to get the federal government to recognize that Jewish students have civil rights that need to be protected under the law, just like any other groups. But then, it's, it's one thing to say that they're protecting Jews against anti-Semitism, 
And another thing to say that they know what anti-Semitism means, because the fact is, even when the federal government acknowledged that they need to protect Jewish students against anti-Semitism, they were not recognizing it when they saw it. Their need- Ken, why was this so controversial? I mean, it was. It, 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 what's fascinating is that I think most Jews understand um, that being Jewish is not merely a religion. It's 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 an ethnicity. It's something that is complex, not simple. Um, and yet there was tremendous resistance to this definition um, and to to classify Jews as people who have rights under the Civil Rights Act. Um, where did you see most of that oppos- opposition coming from? at least initially, and then how did that develop? Initially, I saw it across the board 15, 16 years ago. I saw conservatives who thought that civil rights laws should not be Mm -hmm. interpreted overly expansively. And I had to explain why this was not overly expansive. This was just giving the plain meaning uh, of of the terms. There were liberals who thought that Jews are white privileged people uh, and that civil rights resources should be focused on other groups. There were bureaucrats who are simply change averse and didn't like to be given new marching orders. There were some Jewish people, especially on the left, who are concerned about anything that had even the vaguest suggestion of saying that Jews are members of a separate race or nationality or something of that sort. But what we were doing was very simple. It was saying that Jews are members of a group that have not only a shared faith or religion, but also a shared background, what you might call shared ancestry or ethnicity. And for that reason, deserve the same sorts of protections that any other national origin group would receive under yeah, that's, the Yeah, that was a really, um, that was like a leap of imagination um, for so many people. But, you know, some of it, as you say, was innocent or was just normal resistance to, you know, doing something new to it, to an explanation. But some of it was clearly ideo- ideological. It was rooted in hostility to Israel, uh, rooting, rooted really in hostility to understanding, um, you know, what the issues were. And I think that gets to the next question, which you already raised, which was how you define anti-Semitism. And the um, the IH, you know, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance uh, definition of anti-Semitism, which has been recognized by the United States government, many other governments, provides um, the most comprehensive and um, really uh, important definition, widely recognized, but still, there are a lot of people who um, reject it, resent it, because they fear that, um, you know, using all the horrible analogies about Israel and not merely criticizing Israel, but seeking to delegitimize the one Jewish state on the planet is clearly anti-Semitism. And that's one thing they still want to be able to do freely. Sure. Um, I certainly have had friends and allies at every step along the way, but also resistance every stop along the way, not just on the IRA definition, but even on the very basic notion that Jews should be protected under the civil rights laws, uh, met with uh, passionate, adamant resistance by people who were generally under the uh, understanding that sometimes they would agree and sometimes they would disagree w- with what an administration does. But this really did get under people's skins in an extraordinary way. So while, yes, it's true, I would say that there were some neutral reasons people gave for their opposition to protecting Jewish students under the civil rights laws, the forcefulness, the adamance, the anger in the opposition has been extraordinary. And it has been not just about IRA, not just about Israel, but about any protection against Jews in American educational institutions. And I have seen it um, for at least 15 or 16 years. When the executive order came out of the Trump administration, of course, uh, there was another level of opposition uh, because there are some people who are adamantly opposed to anything that comes from Republican administrations in general, but in particular, that would have the signature of, of Donald Trump. So I think that that accelerated the disagreements uh, and the 
uh, oppositions. The IRA definition shouldn't be controversial, and in a sense, it isn't. I mean, the fact is, if you look at measures that have any real um, strength in the field of civil rights, everything is controversial. Here we have with the so-called IRA working definition of anti-Semitism, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Here you have a definition that's been agreed upon by over 30 countries around the world, countries with very different governments, a very different ideology. Uh, it has been uh, adopted by dozens of major Jewish organizations who agree on little else other than this. Uh, it has increasingly been adopted by all sorts of organizations. Yes, there is disagreement about it, as there is about any civil rights issue. But the IRA definition has, especially over the last few years, gotten much broader, widespread, bipartisan, international agreement, agreement than virtually any other civil or human rights um, advance yeah, I think that, one, that one can think of a couple of very important points about how the IHLRA definition really shouldn't be controversial. It's very straightforward. Um, it's detailed. It's easily understood. But, you know, there was a difference between the opposition to when you first um, began your efforts um, in terms of applying Title VI to discrimination against Jews um, in the, the first decade of this millennium in the Bush administration. It wasn't as big a deal. Um, it didn't generate that much uh, anger. It was controversial among those who cared about the issues. But when, um, you know, the executive order that um, uh, that applied uh, these uh, the Title VI to uh, to colleges and universities was handed down, it became intensely uh, controversial. I know I was on an NPR program shortly after that where they actually trotted out somebody who was a, a former Soviet Jew and was able, actually comparing it to the uh, to the communist government of the Soviet Union, as as if the effort to make um, to to stop anti-Semitism was itself anti-Semitic. Um, that's how crazy the debate on that issue came, and, and certainly you felt the brunt of that, didn't you? I did, although I have to say even the, the first step during the George W. Bush administration ignited furious opposition. It just didn't have the same mm -hmm. level of media attention. So the opposition was more behind uh, closed scenes, uh, closed doors. Uh, with the executive order was actually signed by the president, got uh, national media attention, including uh, an unfortunately misleading Indeed. article in the New York Times that led the coverage. Uh, and so there was also a furious uh, opposition, but it was on a bigger stage because it was higher higher profile. I think it's important to realize that virtually everything that we have done protecting Jewish students has ignited controversy, whether it has to do with Israel or not. But because the IRA example, uh, IRA definition has examples relative to Israel, that also has led to um, probably more misunderstanding and more. Yeah, let's stress for a Israel. moment um, some of the resistance, which takes up the idea that it's wrong to, not merely, you know, yes, the idea that Jews should have specific civil rights was controversial, but the idea that the federal government should be trying to police anti-Semitism on college campuses, force universities to do something about it, force them in, you know, in some, in some cases to stop promoting uh, curricula courses that were themselves, you know, uh, by definition, anti-Semitic, um, saying that the people will say, well, that's interfering with academic freedom. It's interfering with, with freedom of speech. Uh, explain for us why those arguments really fall flat. The big picture of what we're asking for is that the federal government protect Jewish students' rights to the same extent and in the same way that it protects everyone else's rights. Uh, it is not new for the federal government to ensure equal uh, educational opportunities in the schools. That goes back certainly to Brown versus Board of Education. It goes back to a similar vintage in higher education level. We have long since as a country made the decision that when federal funds go to educational institutions, uh, those institutions cannot use the money uh, in ways that either segregate or harass uh, or discriminate. 
So what's being done here is simply applying the same rules and the same principles in the same ways. Now, I will have to uh, acknowledge that when federal civil rights laws are applied, there's always the possibility of infringement of the First Amendment. And that's true whether we're talking about sex discrimination, race discrimination, anti-Semitism across the board. And I think that there are times when civil rights laws have been used overly aggressively for any of those groups. And I think that the Jewish community needs to be aware of this and needs to be uh, as protective of free speech as, as anyone else. There are some cases where I would say that allegations have been made that I think that go over the, over, the, over the line. So I think that we need to be uh, careful to make sure that we are not interfering with academic freedom, but we shouldn't have different standards for the First Amendment or academic freedom when it comes to Jewish speech than we have. Just, just to you know, jump speech. in and just to pose an example of that, um, I don't think anyone or anyone sane or anyone living in the real world would be opposed to the federal government intervening if co if a uh, university were to authorize you know a Ku Klux Klan chapter and allow them to conduct activities on campus and interfere with the uh, the lives of African American students or to or to funding courses with a KKK curriculum um nobody would think that was right everybody would think that had to be stopped and that any any uh, any institution that was allowing that to happen should should lose its federal funding, but yet um, there are institutions in this country which have allowed, say, for example, Students for Justice in Palestine, which is, I think, by any reasonable definition, a hate group in terms of um, the rhetoric that it uses and the tactics that it uses, and any interference in in their efforts, which are ongoing, there are, there are continuing controversies around them is considered somehow different, but it really isn't that different, is it? You know, I've been saying for years that some of these anti-Israel extremist organizations are mm -hmm. racist hate groups, and we need to say it, and we may need to say it consistently and forthrightly. Uh, about three years ago, an undercover reporter uh, got access to my office uh, on behalf of uh, um, on behalf of uh, an anti-Israel organization and taped me saying essentially that and then put it out there as if it was a big revelation um, that I was saying in private the same thing that I say in public, which is that uh, anti-Israel hate is hate and should be shamed and condemned the same way that we uh, shun and condemn uh, other forms. Of yeah, um, but we've had trouble getting that idea across, haven't we? There, there's still a lot of resistance to it. Um, and I, I think part of the problem, um, we've alluded to it before already, even just in, in this program, is the way some toxic ideologies that are extremely fashionable, namely critical race theory and certainly intersectionalism, which treats all struggles of all peoples as one big thing and identifies and wrongly analogizes the Palestinian war to destroy Israel with the struggle for civil rights in the United States as giving a permission slip to certain kinds of hate, including anti-Semitism, anti you know, and extreme anti-Israel activity, making, making clear, of course, it's not about criticism of Israel. Anybody can criticize Israel. It's about whether, any, whether Israel ought to be allowed to exist is the issue. And yet um, there still seems to be a lot of resistance to understanding this basic fact, isn't there? It's actually gotten worse and it's gotten worse in ironic ways, even since the Black Lives Matter movement and the George Floyd episode led to increased sensitivity and awareness on many college campuses of other forms of prejudice. And in fact, some of the diversity, equity and inclusion programs that have been either established or ramped up over the past year or two during a time of heightened sensitivity have actually made it worse for Jewish uh, students, professors, and staff. What we've seen is that in some of these programs, either Jews and Jewishness is ignored altogether, and Jewish Americans are told that they need to own their privilege as white people, uh, white or white adjacent, and that the only uh, way in which they should participate in these programs uh, is as uh, white oppressors.
and who need to deal with uh, their history of oppressing others. Or alternatively, uh, when anti-Jewish stereotypes are used uh, to address uh, Jewish Americans as people who have particular privilege uh, because of wealth and, and, and so on and so forth. So we've seen, especially in the last year, year and a half, that the uh, increase in diversity, equity, and inclusion programs has perversely made the situation even worse than it had been before. Yeah, and I think that that goes to the heart of the issue about how anti-Semitism gets enabled by ideologies that single out Jews in this manner and which falsely accuses them of, falsely accuses Israel of having white privilege, which makes no sense because the majority of Israeli Jews aren't, are actually people of color by the definitions of, uh, of the intersectional movement. But it has it has created this idea that it's open season for one form of hate and um, that somehow efforts to stop other kinds of hate um, should involve somehow allowing discrimination against Jews. That's right. And it's become different and more targeted than even just a couple of years ago. Uh, it was the case um, just not too long ago, pre-COVID, that mostly we were seeing speech that was uh, offensive, and it was generally about Israel or Israelis. Nowadays, we are increasingly seeing that anti-Semitism being translated in a much more personal, in-your-face way into actions that target specific Jewish students. So, for instance, we are seeing increasingly efforts to marginalize Jewish students and organizations, to try to expel or impeach them from student government positions, uh, efforts to marginalize and exclude either Hillel or other Jewish organizations unless they will become in some way anti-Israel. Anti it is a much more in-your-face, personalized attack um, than we'd seen just a couple of years ago. Yeah, this is linked to the rise of the BDS movement in this country uh, as well, isn't it? Um, uh, and how how does that movement, which of course is, links up with the other phenomena we've been talking about, work to make this, uh, to make life more uncomfortable for Jewish students, to create in essence a hostile environment? BDS was never just about passing boycott, divestment, or resolution movements. It was also about changing the atmosphere on college campuses and elsewhere so that Israel would be perceived not as one of the world's great democracies, but as a peculiarly evil uh, entity, and that Israelis would be seen in that way. And an offshoot has always been that Jewish students caught up in this would be viewed in ways that are informed by the rhetoric of the BDS movement. It's not just political speech. It is the changing of an atmosphere, which is why the AMCA initiative has documented that on campuses where the BDS movement is active, there are more incidents that target Jewish students uh, for attack. We've seen that to some extent for years. We've seen students being either spit at or otherwise uh, harassed, especially on campuses where BDS is, is active. Now we're seeing it much more often, and we're seeing it even on campuses where BDS isn't involved. Nowadays, there's a shift. So yes, BDS continues to be big, but anti-normalization is often even larger, which is to say whether student governments are considering BDS resolutions or not, Students are gathering together to exclude other Jewish students who may be pro-Israel or Jewish pro-Israel organizations. Yeah, um, I, I think that, that's, that's, that's a very important point in terms of how the situation has escalated. Um, part of it, um, as you say, it's linked to what the, the events of the summer of 2020 which energized, you know, um, a movement rooted in this ideology. But, you know, in, in, in terms of it getting worse, how do you see any, a distinction in terms of how your successors, I mean, you, you left um, the government in the, you left the, the government in, in, two, in uh, mid 2020, 2020, and um, how do you see your successors doing on this issue uh, at the Department of Education now? Well, first of all, they've not been outspoken, and this is a time for speaking out. This fall, we have seen an intensity of anti-Jewishness, which is greater than we've seen before. 
And it's starting earlier in the academic year, and it's happening even on campuses that have had reduced activity because of COVID. There is much more of an abrasive, confrontational anti-Semitism, uh, and we need to hear the Biden administration speak out against it. We are pleased that the Biden State Department has uh, explicitly uh, endorsed the IRA definition. Uh, we would like to hear that from the Biden Education Department. We know uh, that this administration supports IRA when it comes to assessing the actions of foreign governments and institutions, but we need to protect our students here as well. We haven't seen that yet. It's still early. We need to see action from the new administration. Right. Now, um, you've been in and out of government, um, in public service, in private life, you know, over the course of a long period of time. Um, I guess the first question I want to ask you about that is, you know, you were in the Trump administration, which was widely perceived or widely reported as if it was just this ongoing train wreck and, uh, you know, dysfunctional. What was life like at the Department of Education for you from 2018 to 2020? And how did you see the government working from that perspective? I was surrounded uh, during the Trump administration with um, some excellent, um, highly qualified um, officials um, under Secretary Betsy DeVos. That's right. And I, I should add that if, if there was any cabinet member that was got a, got a lot of guff from the press and with, got a terrible press, it was certainly her. But she uh, and the, the, the president brought on with her concurrence uh, senior officials who had the same sorts of high level credentials as uh, during prior administrations, mm -hmm. people who had either been heads of universities or university systems, a former lieutenant governor, people with this sort of basic credentials. So there were serious people doing serious work in a way that was certainly more conservative in some areas than we'd seen uh, under prior administrations. Uh, but which was basically a matter of people trying to make educational systems work better. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was <laughs> what you're saying is that, you know, your department functioned pretty well and actually got an enormous amount done um, during your time there. In fact, so much that um, you, you got, you got a lot of flack from the New York times about going and coming um, during your time there. I did indeed, but they did acknowledge, I think, um, uh, even in the criticism, the uh, volume of work that we accomplished uh, within the Office for Civil Rights. Certainly some of the most high profile work was protecting Jewish students. That mm -hmm. is what they got their hackles up. Uh, but we also issued not only new regulations under Title IX, but also several of the largest, most ambitious uh, Title IX investigations of both universities and also public schools that had ever been uh, done uh, major initiatives protecting students with disabilities, the creation of an outreach office, uh, a lot of very meaningful work, some high profile, some less high profile, uh, but work that needed to be done to protect students of all backgrounds. Yeah, one of the other controversial policies that the Department of Education was involved in was changing the way, um, or at least trying to create a, um, a more fair process for dealing with accusations of, uh, of sexual crimes um, from a position where they were, you know, where anybody accused basically was in a star chamber proceeding without much uh, right to defend himself, you or himself or herself. Uh, that changed for a while, but that's been reversed, hasn't it? There has been an announcement by the Biden administration that they plan to issue a new regulation, mm -hmm. uh, which most um, people uh, expect will involve some form of reversal. You observe that the Trump administration's work in this area was controversial, but of mm -hmm. course the prior administration's work was no less controversial. Uh, my successor, of course, uh, being confirmed just very recently, uh, on a 51-50 uh, vote that required, uh, I'm sorry, a, 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 yeah, 51-50 vote that required the vice president uh, to, to get involved, largely because of how much uh, fear there has been that, that the new administration will roll back protections um, mm -hmm. that uh, the accused receive 
uh, and need to receive in um, sexual harassment and sexual assault hearings. Yeah, and that has become that 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 was the supposed controversy, um, creating a, a sort of a fairer, more fair process, um, which some people opposed. Um, I should say that some of the new due process protections have also been established by U.S. courts um, mm -hmm. to the level of U.S. courts of appeals. Those protections uh, cannot be reversed so easily and certainly cannot be reversed merely by a regulation at the Department of Education. So some of the due process advances of the last few years uh, are likely to stay for quite some time. As for what this administration will do on other of the due process protections, you know, that's a continuing process. Yeah, I think the, you know, the question is, um, I know there were cases that were brought during your time, um, getting back to the anti-Semitism issue and of um, anti-Israel invective, uh, those involving uh, joint courses with the University of North Carolina and Duke, um, you know, the Rutgers investigation, which which you brought out of mothballs the Obama administration had refused to investigate charges of anti-Semitism. You, you raised that case and brought it back to life. Um, how are those, how are those sorts of cases being handled now by your successor? It's hard to see because there have been a few uh, announcements from the administration. There are currently a large number of pending complaints some of which have been open for investigation, some of which are pending in a pre-investigation uh, phase. It appears as if the wheels have slowed down. Now, maybe some of those cases have been held until a new confirmed assistant secretary is in place, and there is now a new uh, confirmed assistant secretary. Uh, but there are a very large number of cases that have been pending significantly longer than the 180 day standard for OCR uh, resolutions. And at some point there has to be something done to, uh, to address them. Yeah, let me just bring, bring it down to sort of the personal level in terms of how, um, when students are faced with a situation where they feel they're being targeted, where they feel the situation is unfair, it is a hostile environment. What should they do? What is your advice? How, what's the procedure? How should they go about it? How should their parents be helping them? Um, what, what's, what, what do they do other than just talk to people about it? Um, wh where do they go? They can always come to us at the Brandeis Center at BrandeisCenter.com, and we're always mm -hmm. uh, available to help. Now, these situations vary considerably, and I don't want to make assumptions. There are cases involving physical violence where law enforcement needs to be brought in. There are cases that are uh, much less significant, although they may be personally painful, involving either a joke or some minor incident, um, which uh, certainly don't merit a, a federal uh, investigation. There are some matters that are appropriate for the college's uh, internal equal opportunity grievance process. There are others that probably are either too small or too large for that. There are some cases in which they should involve uh, other sorts of support from within the university, uh, either uh, a supportive professor or the Hillel or a Chabad. Uh, but I would say that uh, the reason that the Brandeis Center exists is to help students to navigate uh, this difficult process that they have uh, and to know that they are not alone uh, when they are dealing with the anti-Semitic incidents. Tell me more about how the Brandeis Center works and how it's sort of day-to-day -day activities. What, what are the things you're involved in? What are the projects you're pursuing right now um, to deal with these issues and the other, the broader points of, of uh, defending Jews, uh, uh, you know, in, in creating, uh, you know, a, a place to go for people who find discrimination? Sure. So first, we're continually doing research and education, and we've come out um, – very recently with a survey of Jewish fraternity and sorority members that shows much more vividly than we'd seen before uh, that not only have most um, such students uh, been aware of or experienced anti-Semitism within the prior, uh, the prior semester, but that a half of these openly actively Jewish students 
have taken some action to hide their Jewish identity. And this is something that we find appalling. Part of what we do is that sort of research. Part of what we do is to develop chapters and fellowship programs for law students because we are building essentially an army of uh, Jewish uh, Americans and friends of Jewish Americans who are fighting uh, anti-Semitism. But the day-to-day -day work of the Louis D. Brandeis Center primarily consists of working with students, faculty, and staff who are concerned about problems on their campus and want either guidance or representation. So we are regularly writing letters to administrations, uh, calling them on the phone, asking for change. In some cases, we are filing legal complaints with the agency that I formerly headed, the Office for Civil Rights, or with other uh, federal agencies or state agencies uh, that handle the matter, or occasionally filing complaints with courts uh, to vindicate the rights of either uh, Jewish uh, professors or Jewish students who, who've been violated. So we are a group of lawyers, essentially a kind of a law firm, a public interest legal organization to protect people who have faced discrimination um, of an anti-Semitic nature, particularly at colleges and universities. Getting back to your government service, what was um, sort of what was the uh, the most frustrating thing about being in government, and what was Give me some examples of things where you, you found out things that you didn't know about how government worked and uh, were surprised, or at least happily surprised mm. by it. The frustration is always about how long things take, and that's something to uh, keep in mind when something has been uh, pending for a while. Uh, there were so many times where I felt something needed to be done, but it would take a great deal of time to do it. Even before I was running an agency, I recall um, over 15 years ago, I was a much younger lawyer and I was asked um, how long it would take to develop a policy to protect a freedom of speech. Um, and what I said was rough estimate, um, six months. I said, if I could focus exclusively on this issue, I could write the policy in a day and I could clear it through the bureaucracy in six months. Um, that was maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but not very much. The amount of time that it takes to do the work is slight as compared to the amount of time it takes to get the level of cooperation and attention needed to get the appropriate uh, vetting and uh, to get things through. Um, you asked me what I was especially pleased with in a surprising way. I would say that when I first entered the government, I was surprised both by the complexity of regulations and cases, but also the number of uh, very committed and intelligent career staffers there are who have mastered a surprising amount of it. So I was, I was pleased to see both how hard some of the issues turn out to be and that there are dedicated public servants who are working on, on, on addressing them. Yeah, um, I think certainly there's resistance to government. The idea, you know, Ronald Reagan's, you know, uh, famous line that the uh, most, most scary words in the English language is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But there are processes where the government can help, um, where the government, you know, as we've seen with the Title VI investigations, is the proper way to deal with with certain issues. Um, and yet uh, sometimes... Um, Government can be very energetic when it shouldn't be, but not so energetic when it should be. That's right. We're seeing that this administration has an awareness of how civil rights can be used in an energetic way. Even day one of this administration, the president signed a flurry of executive orders dealing with systemic racism and other issues. We saw the creation of new positions like a deputy um, domestic policy advisor for civil rights issues. So we have seen within the new administration an awareness from literally day one that civil rights can be a very important tool. What we need to see is a recognition that that tool needs to be used and needs to be used quickly to deal with the problems that Jewish Americans are facing. And yet there's still there's still that same resistance that you've been encountering throughout your whole career working on these issues. 
Um, and I think some of that resistance um, has grown even stronger because we are living in this bifurcated society where politics you know, has replaced, I think, in many people's lives, the role that religion used to play. And um, anything that is perceived as somehow conservative or Republican is evil in the eyes of one side and not the other. And, you know, how do we take this issue, which ought to be, but, you know, we talk about bipartisanship, this ought to be a bipartisan concern. How can, you know, how do we remove the politics from it? But because as you saw when you know, Trump signed an executive order on anti-Semitism, it wasn't just that he didn't get credit for it. It was that if he signed it, it had to be evil. It had to be it had to be anti-Semitic as opposed to fighting anti-Semitism, just because you know red state, blue state uh, loyalties come into play with everything, and that's true in it with anti-Semitism as well. It is, it? and we are living in a highly politicized, uh, partisan uh, period in which virtually everything uh, is uh, divisive. And in that context, I have to say, and this is the good news, that while we continue to see a high degree of politicization in this area, I'm also seeing a broader range of mainstream Jewish organizations that are relatively united in recognizing, much more so than 10 years ago, uh, the problem of anti-Semitism in the United States. And while it's true that there are uh, at the fringes, extreme organizations that are making things harder. I now see much more support, much more cooperation, much more uh, of, a, of, of, of a spirit of cooperation among major organizations that may be in the center left, maybe in the center right, maybe in the middle. There's now within the Jewish community on this issue, at least some strong mainstream uh, support for the notion that we need to take action. Yeah, well, I think that's uh, an important and uh, optimistic note. Um, Ken, you've given us a lot to think about and a lot to uh, to chew on. Um, we really appreciate it and thank you for your efforts and uh, the Brandeis Center, um, which is uh, an important resource for Jewish students and for Jewish families that they should think about, they should consider when they're in that position. So we thank you for coming on. We thank our listeners and our viewers for tuning in, whether you're uh, listening to us on Spotify or any of the other um, podcast platforms for audio or watching us on the JNS YouTube station, uh, channel or uh, eventually on JBS TV where this broadcast will eventually air. Thank you. Please like us, uh, like our broadcasts, Give us good reviews, subscribe, and uh, please tune in again next week for another edition of Top Story. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.